Now we are on the munch of Sanjeevni. It's united against cancer. All of you are survivors. And uh, it is perhaps to take the story of hope forward and uh, multiple challenges. So if I may start with you, Lisa. You went public with the diagnosis and you chose the platform of the Toronto Film Festival. That takes a lot of courage. Now where do you find that courage and why did you do it? Uh, thank you, first of all, and thank you for having me here. I'm very honored to be sharing the stage with Yuvraj, who I'm a great admirer um, of his superhero qualities, which for me I define, sorry, I don't really actually watch cricket, <laughs> <laughs> if you can believe it or not. Okay. Um, but, you know, for his incredible resilience and also the philanthropy, that has followed his battle, and Anurag, of course, I am a great admirer of your craft, and then, you know, my admiration goes even deeper after understanding what you've been through as well. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think that cancer as a disease is also uh, so multi-layered, and I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's so many different types of cancers, and each cancer comes with its own prognosis, diagnosis, um, it's actually all put in one bucket, but they're very different. And, in, in, you know, the point of that is that each patient, their journey is so incredibly individual. And I guess for me, when I was diagnosed, I was 37. And you might say I was riding on a bit of a high in, in life. Um, at the same time, uh, I was ignoring a lot of the signals that my body was giving me. Okay. And, uh, you know, like everyone, I was sort of had fallen prey to that hustle culture. And if I was feeling really fatigued, I would just, you know, maybe cut out my rice, drink more coffee. But, you know, I'd do anything except go to the doctor, which is my bad. <laughs> and um, finally, I couldn't ignore the signs and... Um, you know, the investigations led to me being diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And it just so happened that everything coincided. I was diagnosed in August of 2009. And I had a film coming out in the Toronto Film Festival in, 2000, in September 2009. So I was obviously put in a very strange situation. Um, because I immediately started treatment and part of my treatment was steroids, very, very heavy steroids and anyone who's been on steroids knows that they will actually change your appearance. So I bloated up, you know, I was 40 pounds overweight and that's not a big deal when you're saving your life but when you have to step on the red carpet, it's a bit of a big deal. So I had to make a very quick choice about whether I hide um, or I could actually use this particular event of being on the red carpet, which is often used to talk about glamour or film release, or in the case of women, you know, often women are sort of criticized and, you know, basically torn apart, uh, you know, on the red carpet. Um, I realized that I could actually subvert that moment uh, to first of all talk about my cancer, which is a very relatively rarer cancer. You might call it an orphan cancer. And as we all know in the cancer community, uh, the louder, m more um, strident cancers get more research money and more attention. So I realized maybe, even though I was grappling with this really distressing situation, I thought maybe I can actually use this situation, first of all, to bring a little bit of attention to my cancer. Second of all, I felt like maybe it will break the stigma because I personally could not understand why everybody around me was advising me not to speak about my cancer publicly. Mm. It didn't make any sense because first of all, I didn't feel I was to blame. And then second of all, we know that cancer is something that is becoming more epidemic. Yes. Um, you know, everybody knows someone who's affected. So why are we pretending? Why are we hiding this? Where does the shame come from? And the third question, which was even more deeply personal, was I had actually always felt very deeply uncomfortable on the red carpet. I didn't feel I belonged there. I didn't like being, you know, sort of critiqued and pulled apart as a woman or simply only judged on my appearance. So I felt that I could take all of these three factors and put them together, stand on the red carpet, 
40 pounds heavier than my normal weight, but actually feel very empowered by this moment. And, you know, when I wrote my book about it, I said that actually my shoes don't fit because my feet were so swollen, but ironically, I actually stepped into my body in that moment. And it also gave me purpose. When you're fighting cancer, for me personally, I guess I needed to also find a greater purpose, something larger than myself also to distract myself. So to be honest, it wasn't courage. Hmm. I, it was all of those reasons. But it still was a lot of gumption to be able to do that. And uh, if I may just quickly uh, back to you, Lisa, on the, on, the, on the relapse that happened in 2012, that's a double whammy. Now, how do you deal with that? Okay, you found the courage, the grit, the determination to fight it once. But how do you fight it again? What, what, what went through you then? So, the second round was obviously significantly different. I'd learned so much more about myself, my disease. Um, and I just felt, because the first one was a huge slap in the face, because it was sudden and dramatic. The second, when I, when I relapsed, we were monitoring my uh, protein levels in my blood, the protein marker in my blood. So I could see slowly, slowly, slowly the relapse was happening. So my oncologist sort of prepared me. She said, you have to go in for treatment again. And in my case, it often means a stem cell transplant, which is not a picnic, not something I would actually advise. Um, but I just felt deep inside that, look, I'm missing some part of the puzzle. Like there is a message coming to me beyond myself. Hmm. Secondly, I just gotten married. Hmm. So I was like, I have to fight this disease. Otherwise, my husband's going to want a refund very quickly. <laughs> like we had literally just gone through the shadi, everything like that, setting up a new house, etc. I don't know where, I mean, I, you could say that I have a quality that, you know, my mother would have argued was very irritating, but has somewhere come in handy. I'm very stubborn. I'm very stubborn. So when I see a challenge, I refuse to back down. And I think that... I understood with my relapse that my body, again, was trying to communicate something to me. So what I ended up doing, that's when I ended up taking the holistic world, or what we call complementary, alternative, mm. I don't know the exact terminology you want to use, that I'm aligned with, and mix that very, you know, enmesh that with allopathic medicine. Okay. Because I decided to go back on maintenance therapy, so I was taking the drugs that my oncologist advised, but I also went off and changed my lifestyle, you know? I mean, it's very enlightening to hear also like the way that Luke described it, you know, of enmeshing the two. That really is something that somehow or the other I stumbled upon through trial and error, and I went off to a retreat center called the Hippocrates Health Institute. And, you know, this is a very famous thing. I know it's been said before, but it bears saying again that Hippocrates you know, all the doctors take the Hippocratic Oath, right, um, in order not to harm patients, etc. But Hippocrates apparently very famously said, let food be thy medicine. And we don't talk about that enough. And so in this center, I learned a lot more about, you know, lifestyle changes, how to feed myself. We did a lot of, you know, alternative things without ever giving up my medication. So it was not one at the expense of the other. It was actually became a beautiful marriage. And you might say that I'm still propped up by that marriage even today. So that's, you know, and, and by the way, a very quick thing. So my oncologist was very um, skeptical about all of this. But I went off and I did my treatments and I saw a lot of also people who helped me also emotionally, spiritually, all of that stuff while taking my medication. After three months, I went back and saw my oncologist, and we were supposed to prepare for my stem cell transplant. And my cancer was gone. It was gone. Wow. And you know what she said to me, of course, being a good clinician, but now she had become a friend, she said, listen, I don't want to know what you're doing, but just keep doing it, whatever you're doing. <laughs> 